mic will work. There we go. Are we there? Okay, cool. Um, hello, everyone. It is great to be back. Yes, you will be seeing more of me over the course of the two days. No, I don't want you to leave the room, all of the people that are leaving right now. Um, <laughs> please, please uh, don't abandon us. So I'm really excited for this next panel. It's called Building a Community. Um, if you think about you know, maybe a Web2 brand that would have had a panel called Building a Community a couple years ago, you might cringe because it's the hot word of the moment and it usually means a brand trying to take advantage of a community versus actually trying to think about what it wants and feels. And you know, I heard from someone that's 19 last year that said, if a brand is doing a good job, I feel like I'm buying my voice back. Um, and so I'm really excited to have some people here today who are real innovators in the space. So I'm gonna bring them on stage. We have Amber, who's the head of strategic communities for Discord. We have Alex, who is actually the mayor of Friends with Benefits, FWB. We have Adelina, who's a community manager for World of Women. And we have the famous Rod, who is our head of developer relations at Ledger. Okay, thank you everyone for for joining us at Ledger Open and, and sharing your thoughts and perspectives. Um, I'm gonna kick it right off with you, Amber. So, Hello, bonjour. He Hello. Bonjour, everybody. Bonjour. Uh, bonjour. Uh, je suis désolé pour mon français. Um, so, you know, you're at Discord. Obviously, there's, there's like 150 million active monthly users on Discord. It's pretty crazy. It's everyone from artists to sneakerheads. What do you do for all of these community leaders that might not have ever done this before for the first time. Like, how, how, how do you help them? Um, well, first of all, I've seen a lot of people in the audience on Discord. Can I just see a show, a show of hands? Who is on Discord? Okay, so wow. that's like the whole room. <laughs> well, thank, first of all, thank you for building with us. Um, you know, we, uh, we're so excited that you're building with us. Um, in terms of like moderating a community for the first time or being a community manager, Discord has done actually an incredible job of building out an entire moderator academy. So if you haven't checked that out, that's probably a really good place to start. Um, and then I would say on top of that, you know, community management is very different from moderation. And um, Discord has an incredible amount of features where you can essentially allow your community to be self-sustaining. So what Alex and I were just talking about is that you don't want to think about it in this kind of web two centralized way. You actually want to give more power to your community members and use Discord's role functions. I mean, Discord started as a way for gamers to speak with each other. And some of our biggest communities have almost, you know, a million members in. So I think it's about giving control to your community and allowing them to sort of self moderate with you. Now, Discord is a tool that communities can kind of live and grow and thrive on. Uh, FWB is a DAO. And FWB is definitely a DAO that's been looked at over the last six months to really change sort of the value system of how individuals engage together in this coalition. Um, Alex, can you talk a little bit about what you've actually done over the last six months to, to help drive that and what the initial value system was for FWB that you think cemented it in that role? Yeah, happy to. Uh, first off, thanks for having us all. It's really great to be in Paris and to be talking to you guys about communities and DAOs and Web3. Um, in terms of value creation and, and value sets that define early communities, I think most in the early stages are often sort of defined by, say, the founding team or, or, or the founder or the groups of individuals. In this case, you know, Trevor's spoken at length about sort of a lot of the, the sort of theory behind Friends with Benefits and why it exists. I think a lot of those initial rails, so for us, it was, you know, fluid payments between creators. It was the idea that everyone was an owner and teaching people about sort of value accrual to, to, to the network as a whole as opposed to specific individuals within a network. Um, it's sort of establishing those sort of foundational points. But I think the most important thing and frankly overlooked thing and kind of what Amber was just mentioning is a lot of those values will also uh, evolve and, and be redefined as more com community members sort of join the network. And it's about creating the right sort of communication channels and the right governance mechanisms to allow for communities to, who feel enough ownership through, through the process of design correctly, right, through token ownership, to begin to continue to evolve those, those values in real time. So a good example of that would be literally three weeks ago, we put together a proposal of an evolved code of conduct. You know, we had sort of a primary version that 
in the beginning of a community, uh, leaders can put, put forth, hey, here are the values, here are the sets of, of how we think about this community. But as the, the entire space has exploded, if DAOs have matured, you know, new needs to be, uh, you know, sort of new challenges need to be addressed even sort of prior to. And, and the community wrote this entire document, put it together to a proposal, folks voted on it, and now it's being implemented uh, sort of in real time. So I think early sets being developed by sort of founding teams, then evolving into sort of this exit to community model where community members are able to sort of pile on, evolve, iterate, and uh, sort of address in real time, and then sort of codify through these new sort of Web3 governance models is what we've seen work really well within Friends of Benefits. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. It's basically that any, anything that you end up sort of decreeing has to have that community emphasis and support. Um, I, I think something that's interesting in that as well is we have Adelina here, who is a community manager for World of Women. And I love that we have a community manager on stage with us because you have to live and breathe the group. And you're also, uh, you know, you're in the middle of, of all the problems, of all the solutions, of the wins. So I, I'm curious in your perspective from, from World of Women, at the beginning, World of Women made it really clear. We're here because we want to push diversity in the space. We're gonna have a public roadmap. We're really encouraging a very clear mandate from the start. Um, do you think that that's what helped initial growth for World of Women? Like as a community manager, how do you see that sort of standard and value help shape what it's become? Um, yeah, it's definitely super important because we want everyone that uh, is in our community to share a set of values and to um, to have the same uh, mission as us uh, as they're gonna make uh, our voice resonate and uh, and yeah so transparency also is very important and and sharing uh, that vision um, this is also why we do a lot of um, of communication we communicate a lot with them like we do uh, weekly. Um, Twitter spaces, uh, newsletters, and uh, and things like that. So uh, so yeah, it's 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 really important that we uh, deliver on uh, on what we said we would, uh, which is like changing the NFT space, and uh, and uh, and yeah. And uh, Rod, you know, this morning Pascal was on stage and talked about the fact that today we finally are a true developer platform. Uh, not not just a vertical, but a horizontal at Ledger. So can you talk a little bit about what developers should actually expect to see from that and how Ledger can support you know, some of these DAOs or the NFTs that are emerging and, and want to be a part of the ecosystem? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I want to thank Amber because now we have our brand new Discord server. So please Ooh. join us. So what we can expect from now, like, well, first, I'll be there 24 seven. Well, not on weekends, hopefully. But uh, we're hosting a lot of office hours, training, open source hackathons, myself included. Uh, with Starton, I've seen you folks here. Last weekend, we were hosting an open source hackathon here in Paris. And you'd be amazing like, how creative developers can be. So hopefully from now on, we're going to see more and more those contributions to make our platform really a platform. So you can expect a lot of activities there. Good. Uh, well, I'm excited for that. Um, I have one other question uh, actually for you, Alex. So uh, one thing that I see in the space is I'm fairly new to Web3, I will fully admit that, um, is there's like so much pride in the fact that Web3 is 24-7. Um, it's not nine to five. H how do you kind of imagine or how do you delegate to the team kind of off hours? Like, you know, what, what is FOMO and what is JOMO, JOMO in FWB? which is joy of missing out, if you okay. didn't know, yeah. Jomo, I've never heard that. Yeah, I think it, this last you know, 12 months, 18 months, in terms of, one, the globalization of all this, really clicking and becoming interconnected, and, and the, the FOMO culture that has been created of like, oh, if you missed out, you missed out on this like, NFT drop that like, only had like a 30 minute window, and now it's sold out, I think is, has, has very sort of drastic long-term effects in terms of how people prioritize what they, what they build and what they don't build. And I, specifically at Friends with Benefits, I can only speak to that. On the contributing team, which we've got now about you know, 40 sort of core contributors and a probably a ring of 100 or so people who are, who are working on different projects, um, we try to really, really much em emphasize a, a culture of 
of sort of support and plugging in and plugging out whenever you need to, because I think you can quickly fall down the rabbit hole very, very fast. And, and if that suits your speed and you want to be 24-7, it's like, by all means, go for it. But so much of Web3 is, is sovereignty, is empowerment, and it would be sort of, I think, antithetical to create a, a corporate culture of, of, of workaholism. Uh, and so specifically in our, in our instance, we, we allow for people to sort of subscribe on different spectrums based on their involvement, which is why, at least within our sort of contributor model, a majority of our contributors are part-time. They're, they're folks who have art practices, they're folks who have uh, sort of startups or different projects that they're, that they're sort of fully working on. And FWB is almost viewed very much as a as an extracurricular and their sort of like suite of activities, allowing them to sort of slide in when they're really obsessive over a specific project. They can, you know, put in, you know, whatever the, the 24 hours, the 24 seven sort of grind cycle, but when they need to sort of pull back to focus on family, friends, other pr passion projects, it's designed in a way where the system can withstand that as opposed to a lot of say corporate environments that just wouldn't work if people were able to move a little bit more fluidly in and out, which I think is the beauty of DAOs and, and sort of this new future of work model. Yeah, I mean, it also really means theoretically that if you're in the DAO, the DAO has your back. So if you're not in a 24-7, you're going to be okay. Yeah. Which I, yeah, it's good to take a deep breath. Um, Amber, let's like flip, flip it. So if I'm, if I'm a Discord user and I'm a newbie, how, what do I do? Like, how do I enter this world? And, and then on the other end, if I'm thinking about that newbie, what are some good tools or tricks that I can use to get that newbie to find me? I think we often uh, use this analogy when, when you're building a Discord server to think about it like Disneyland. You know, when you're creating the server, you're gonna create the ticket booth and then the first ride. And then you're gonna collaborate with your community to design the rest of the server. And um, I think when you're looking at joining Discord or like your users are coming, we often speak internally about getting to this um, magic moment. So 40% of our um, 150 million daily active users spend time in voice chat every single day. So I think utilizing voice to run, for example, like Stripe will run Thursday sessions with their developers, it's like an open office hours in the server. So I think creating um, you know, specific times where newbies understand, okay, this is when I can be in the server, and this is when something is happening, is, is awesome. Um, but obviously, we also have folks who are just in the server all day chatting, but that's not the only way to use Discord. Um, it, it can often seem potentially daunting to be like 24 seven trying to run a server, but you can design the server in ways where it doesn't need to be always on. You can use read-only, and I think for newbies, that's probably, um, less intimidating. But but the other thing is nothing beats like a good welcome. It's like you're getting it going into a house party, you want to be welcomed, you want to be shown where to go. So I think um, you know, if you're if you're running the Discord, you're the community manager, say hi. Doesn't bots are awesome, but you know, nothing beats uh, actual human saying hello, welcome. Yeah, I do find that in the communities that I'm in on Discord, if I feel like I'm getting a note from the actual person, it makes a difference. But more than that, especially for like like one that I joined recently, this artist Lana Delina, she has one for the Mona Lana series, and I see her Discord growing, and it's so satisfying as someone that respects and appreciates her work to also like get to just not always be engaging, but just seeing that happening. Um, I'm I'm curious, Adelina, you know, World of Women is is quite large now. Um, you're starting to see more sort of like Web2 leaders getting involved. There are different drops that are happening. As a community manager, how do you deal with not only that sizable growth really fast, but the internationalization of it? Because Web3 adoption is happening everywhere. It's not, it's not just one way. Uh, so internationalization is really into our DNA. Like from the start, uh, we were international, uh, really. So, um, so so that's like um, normal for uh, for world of women, and as for the growth, like um, to, uh, to 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 um, get on Discord, for example, like we have really great ambassadors and community members that help us onboard new people and um, help us like create more content for uh, for for us and things like that. So um, so yeah, it's uh, it's really helping us like. Our core members are helping us like get even more people uh, involved and have even more ambassadors. So, so that's that's pretty great too. And Rod, I know we talk a lot about this at Ledger that you know we're constantly prioritizing how does someone actually get within the Ledger Live platform. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about our yeses and nos and how we make that prioritization? I know Pascal did announce this morning we'll have our public roadmap soon, which I think is really important. Um, and, and you know, what are tips that developers can can learn who are either watching at home or in the, in the audience um, to have a smoother experience? Well, very good question. <laughs> so first, we have our developer portal, like all our documentation is there, developer.ledger.com. But uh, now that we have a Discord server, I feel that honestly, the best way to get a smoother experience is just talk with us. Most of our teammates are there, so I'm gonna be there to welcome you, hopefully to do a good one and do welcoming message. But also hosting those hackathons, those open office hours, and just being there present. Um, by the way, do ha we do have an open source hackathon happening on, on Gitcoin, so you still have one more week. There are three bounties there, pretty good ones, I would say. And uh, forking those open source repos that are, well, growing as we speak, I think it's the easiest way to start. Like, you don't need to go through everything and build your own integration from scratch. I would say just fork it, play with our APIs and SDK, and just talk with me in case you have any questions. And as more people continue to do that, um, it's almost like the no's become as important as our yeses. So with FWB, there's sort of this intrinsic um, value system that you talked about and, and how, how that's sort of grown and developed by the community. I'm also curious though, because it is so new, how leadership emerged and, and how you know, the contributors that you have or these part-time people in the community, like, how did that process sort of form? Um, and, and what are some of the clear no's that you have in the way that you all work together now? Yeah, the leadership formation was was quite uh, was quite experimental and also emergent in that you know you see a lot of these DAOs which which form and, and you know the new tools that Web three sort of uh, have ushered in these communities forming almost immediately and instantaneously overnight right like an NFT drop happening thousands of people purchase leadership team sort of begins to organically you know form within the the holders or an FWB's instance, sort of a small core team of, of, of founders, uh, Trevor, Dexter, different folks who come together and, and sort of set a lot of those initial parameters. And as the community began to evolve, a core yes within our, within our community was, are we always building uh, you know, within the context of, of, of solving for unmet needs of the community, right? Never trying to sort of build extraneously just to build, but really looking at what, does, what do the token holders within FWB uh, verbally sort of communicate in terms of, of, of needs they have and in, in, in being, being within our space. And in the initial stages, it was clear that having someone sort of spend sort of a full-time focus on, you know, sort of majorly community governance, communication, setting parameters, building hiring pipelines, you know, sort of the basics of like transitioning from an internet kind of amorphous experiment into something a little bit more structured. So community members had clear ways to plug in was sort of at a, at a, at a pivotal moment um, that FWB needed to sort of endure and go through. And so that's when uh, Trevor uh, had gotten me involved and, and I joined the community to sort of begin to experiment with it and saw all the magic that uh, just initially enticed me and frankly like pilled me into Web3 in terms of someone who previously had just passively invested in, 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 in looked at different projects. But FWB was sort of one of the first sort of clicks for me and, and, and whoa, this, you know, sovereignty, ownership, empowerment, governance, you know, users and networks and platforms being aligned, all that became really exciting to me. Uh, and so I was the full, first sort of full-time contributor to join, uh, playing a lot of those foundational roles of just building different structures in ways that other contributors could then become like, oh, these are my skill sets, here's where I can plug in. And so the first sort of two months of my role per se was as the mayor or whatnot, as an elected sort of representative of the people, was thinking about, you know, what are those needs that the community has? You know, in instances in Discord, there's so much async, uh, sort of so much synchronous content happening all the time. One of the first products we launched was a community aggregated and sourced roundup or newsletter of major NFT drops or sort of protocol updates or major or just culture news that was happening within our the confines of our sort of city or our community. And a community member of editors putting those together into a weekly TLDR is the name of the newsletter. And seeing just, you know, one, the immediate reception of that to like, I think 85% open rates or something insane was like initial as someone who came from sort of a web two trad world of like, whoa, you're usually forcing users to open emails. Now it's like they want to read it because the community's generating the content became a big unlock of making sure products 
making sure services all follow suit of, of sort of meeting those unmet uh, sort of challenges. And so from there, it became quite easy to begin to identify clear areas like product, editorial, the community wanted to gather, COVID was sort of shaking down a bit and people wanted to meet in these cities. And then just to begin tapping contributors who are active in the community to begin to lead those specific departments. And most importantly, within a DAO token framework, give them and reward them and pay them in tokens for their contributions, uh, which is by far the most exciting part of someone who's been a community builder, but never having the right levers or mechanisms to incentivize a reward, and now being able to properly give people ownership, voting power, and capital in the form of tokens for their uh, contributions. Yeah, well, I, I, I will say I think mayor is probably the best title you, one can have. Um, but, you know, we, we've spoken a little bit about sort of like the promise of community and what it takes to, to build some of the founding blocks. Um, now, as we think about some of the boundaries and we're getting to a place where we can see how some of these different communities are existing, you know, I always say human emotions don't change, boundaries change. There were always people that went to the public hangings and there are always people that are trying to fight for good. And one of the debates around the emergence of, of Web3, and obviously we're all on stage, we believe in equitable access and providing information, which is what I think is wonderful about what everyone does here. Um, but, but how do you see within your own communities sort of mitigating some of the real fear factors of, well, what could this evolve into? Like, how, how do we allow um, accessibility and the ability for, for this future to continue to grow? Um, because th that is a, a lot of debate and, and sort of internal angst right now as we see adoption for some and, and still not for many, and it'll take time, right? But, but that's part of it, and everyone has a role to play. Um, so I'm curious for a couple of the panel members' thoughts on this. Um, Rod, actually, I'm kind of curious from like the developer perspective what you think there. Yeah, um, maybe I'll, I'll sound repetitive here, but that's why I'm, I'm really a huge fan of open source, like making it publicly available so everyone, even if it's not considered a developer that wants to play, so I highly encourage you, if you're still coming from Web 2 or in learning to be a Web 3 developer, just download the, go to our repo, download an, an example of an application which, which is already running, and uh, you're going to have a lot of fun there. I think this is one of the best ways to do it. And also creating those opportunities to engage with young developers like we did last weekend. I'm um, looking forward to, to be out of the office more often. Adelina? So, um, about the boundaries? How do you see as World of Women continues to grow, um, you know, obviously accessibility and values are at the core of, of what your group is, but, um, you know, many people still don't even have access to the internet, right? And so how, how has, has World of Women been having any discussions about enhancing or maintaining accessibility as it grows or trying to get new users to be able to adopt, just thinking about some of those future plans. So, yeah, the goal is definitely to bring more people into NFTs and more specifically like women or uh, minorities. And um, to do that, we're like, we're trying to educate a lot of people. So, as I was saying, like our community members are super benevolent and help people uh, being welcomed. We also have like a educational hub with like lots of articles and stuff for people who don't know anything about NFTs. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's like uh, lots of um, educational content so that people don't get too lost in this new universe that can be a little uh, hectic when you don't know anything about it. Alex? Yeah, <clears throat> I think education can be uh, sort of addressed in, in a handful of different uh, mediums and a lot of instances, right? Like the medium can, can be the message in and of itself. I think for, for us, it's, it's interesting to think about, I mean, even if you zoom out, right, if, if sort of DeFi brought in over the last 100 million users of sort of crypto and, 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 and yield farming and taking all these things out, like, frankly, I personally wish I got involved earlier, but it never sort of struck me or, or I found I wasn't able to, like, educate myself quick enough to, to feel like I could catch that curve. Uh, I think culture and what we're seeing with NFTs, DAOs, are going to bring in sort of the next, you know, 500 million billion users because it's... it's it's significantly easier in terms of th these levers of fandom to quickly teach yourself to buy an NFT if, if you're 18 years old and your favorite artist is doing a drop, right? I think in Friends with Benefits, that, sort of Trojan, ho that Trojan horse model is totally how we think about it, uh, in, in that many of our community members join not through just crypto Twitter and then like signing up, buying tokens, and, and, and joining the Discord, but what we're seeing more and more is our, our, is our 
is exposure to our community being through our events or being through our cultural experiences where, you know, it might be difficult to, to learn how to go from, you know, Uniswap to MetaMask to connect to Wallet to join a Discord, but to learn how to buy five FWB because Azealia Banks is playing that night and your friend here tells you about it and you need to buy tokens to get into a party, I think is a fundamental mechanic that a lot of people will sort of muscle their way through to figure out and, and, and thus like almost before they know it have been onboarded into crypto and then be like, well, what do I do with these tokens? and then join the Discord, join the community, and begin to, oh wait, these tokens I can sell, and they appreciate it in value because I showed up and I brought my friends, and we all had a great time, and we created, we, we validated sort of the model. Um, so we think of a lot about education in terms of uh, sort of Trojan horsing through different sort of cultural um, approaches, and then from there kind of wrapping the larger mission and vision of, of, of creating bridges between creative communities and, 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 and cultural communities with, with Web3 through those, uh, through those approaches. Well, I'd definitely double click on that. I mean, Ledger's, Ledger's whole philosophy for trying to reach new people is around content and education. We think that a lot of the terminology is really prohibitive and that you need culture as a prerequisite to authority for kind of anything that you do. So. Yeah, I mean, 100%. I also think what's interesting is like this age aspect actually does really play such a big part, but also like what your sort of previous user behavior was. Like Discord obviously started as a gamer experience and community. Uh, I'm kind of curious, like what is a recent server that surprised you with its growth or its activity? Uh, well, I just say on the on the last point that um, you know blockchain is ultimately a community orientated protocol. So the more that you can collaborate with your community to educate your growing community, the better. And you know Discord is trying really hard to you know fight spam, to give more resources, to help developers who are building these communities. You know keep everybody safe um, and thank you to really our, our whole user base, everybody here who's collaborating with us. Um, you know, bots are such a fundamental part of our, our ecosystem. And actually, um, now to, to your question, one of, one of my favorite uh, Discord servers is, is the servers that make it feel like it is a physical place. So there's Discord Cafe and there's a Dynabot in there. And um, we talked earlier a bit about um, digital goods and what you can do in the cafe is you can, you earn tokens as being part of the community and then you can order things from a digital menu and then a bot will DM you the digital good and these are phenomenally popular um, as we spend you know more time online like in another reality like building these types of physical hybrid worlds is, is really interesting and um, I think if anybody here is thinking about getting started or getting you know your discord server up and running um, a great way to start, I think, is how StockX did it, actually, is they, they kicked off on Discord with a five-day StockX event. They had, they utilized stage channels, they had drop-in audio channels, streaming, everything happening all in one place. Um, and that, you know, 20,000 people joined that server in the first 24 hours. So I think um, bridging the kind of physical hybrid world is, is very interesting. And, um, you know, creating a, creating a space where you just kind of want to hang out all day and, and learn is, um, is awesome to see. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, and I was just talking with Pascal actually in between sessions before and we were talking about like a potential projection around the future value of Bitcoin. And he was like, I mean, yeah. And he was like, listen, I'm not speculating, but I think the thing that's valuable when you think about it is the actual value of Bitcoin from the fact, comes from the fact that if people are investing, it makes the chain secure because you have more individuals participating on it. And I think that philosophy is so true for Web3, but for everything that everyone on stage is doing, because the more people who are willing to take a bet, take a day, take a moment to engage, they're actually helping to build the credibility and longevity of the project, um, which is really different. And you know, I even think about communities and the future of DAOs, like when we see what's happening in Wyoming, for example, or other places in the States or El Salvador, they're kind of saying like, okay, like let's try this rumor of post nation state or let's let's try to think about a different way of, of a small ecosystem. And maybe that's crazy, but we'll see. Um, and so I, I am curious, Alex, like, you know, for, for everyone familiar with the Constitution DAO project, that was to actually try to buy a copy of the Constitution, and then to have individuals have the power to sort of manipulate or, or utilize it. And I don't say manipulate in a bad way, because I, I actually tried to be part of that group. But um, uh, I, like, I'm wondering what you think about this aspect of you know, URL to IRL, back to URL, and like what role the DAOs, especially in your perspective as FWB, are in the future of 
community community action in act actualization. Yeah, I hope. I, I truly hope in a, in, a, in a medium to long term horizon, DAOs become sort of true sort of competitive models to, and, and even eventually supersede sort of the traditional LLC C corp you know structure. In that, if you want to build a community owned organization, business, nonprofit, you know any entity. Uh, the DAO model uh, sets you up for, for, for faster pathways, pathways to exit to community, to a lot of these benefits that come when, when, when sort of the network is, is really aligned with its users or its owners or its community members. And so hoping that as, as you know, major consumer brands in, in fashion all the way down to you know, early stage internet projects, I hope that DAOs can just through its transparency, through its governance models, through its voting frameworks, allow f and, and show value that could even accrue to the bottom line uh, if, you're, if you're just a straight up for-profit business, sharing that wealth with your users feels uh, incredibly ambitious, but also I think needed in a, in a, in a, in a medium term horizon. And, and we're, all sort of so, so, we're all sort of still reliving from the, so say the trauma of web two social media, where like so much of us just quickly showed up and began populating these sites with all of our content information and value and artwork and, and, and without really realizing it, you know, if you're not paying for the product, you're the product, that whole adage, hopefully shifting into these, these, these new techno technological platforms that DAOs may enable, where users can quickly see Oh, I can. We can be aligned across all different fronts, and hopefully proving that that it can actually be competitive with some of the mightiest, say, corporations uh, that 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 will need to innovate if they want to if they want to compete. Yeah, I mean, anytime a consumer or an individual is is buying something or spending their time, which is the equivalent value, is like taxation without representation is not going to work anymore. And so, you know, we, we don't have to get into sort of like the open sea debacle that just happened, but like this is, this is real in the transitions. The value systems that are being judged by the communities are every day, and you have to be in touch with them to actually understand if you're gonna make it through that. And so I think what's great is all of you are so in touch deeply with the communities that you're building, you care, and we're just, uh, time ran out very quickly, but we're so pleased that you joined us on stage and, and came with us to open, so everyone's around. Come, come find us after, and yeah, thank you for, for joining us today. Thank you thank for you. having us.